kid actually thinks he needs it, Coke. They put uh, soda water in those things, fizz water, you know. Fizz your stomach up, let it dehydrate you, dry you out, you know. About 30 minutes later, you're going to say, I'll have another Coke. But uh, it's just gumming your lips up. You want something to quench your thirst? Spin down some apple juice and squeeze some lemon in it. That'll kill it. Or get some real thin iced tea like these southerners have. And then put a little bit of sugar in it like these Yankees do. <laughs> That'll kill it. Or ice water. Or real thin lemonade. But Coca-Cola quenching your thirst. What in the world, oh man. Did you ever hear a bottle of Coke around that got warm? You want to drink something sometime. Take a, take a cola cola just sitting there on a shelf for about four days and open it and drink it. See how much it does to your thirst? Then gum your mouth together. Like a fella gave, gave a color fella working for him two bottles of glue and told him to test it and see which one was the best. A day later he said, well, he said, he said, this first one, he said, it, it, it stuck my teeth together better, but the other one tastes better. <laughs> Caught him out in his mouth. All right, 29. They shall lie with you the circumcised, with them and go down to the pit. They will be the prince of the north, all of them, and all the Zidonians, which are gone down with the slain. For their terror, they are ashamed of their might. And they lie on the circumcised with them that be slain by the sword, and bear their shame, for them that go down to the pit. No, he was in the south. Uh, Prince of the North are connected in Daniel with a man called the King of the North. But he is in, in the South. 31. Pharaoh shall see them. I comment on this last time. Pharaoh shall see them, type of the Antichrist, and shall be comforted over all his multitudes. Even Pharaoh and all his armies, slain by the sword, saith the Lord God. For I have caused my terror in the land of the living. He shall be laid in the midst of the uncircumcised with them that are slain with the sword. Even Pharaoh and all his multitudes, saith the Lord God. All right, turn out of Revelation for a minute, and I'll show you this army. Uh, Revelation 9, 14. This army that shows up in the tribulation to help the Antichrist is all killed at the second advent, and there are 200 million of them in number. Revelation 9, 14. Revelation 9, 14. The same the sixth angel which hath the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loose which were prepared for an hour, a day, a month, and a year to slay the third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of that. Why, well, Revelation 19, let's see what happens to them. Revelation 19. <coughs> Revelation 19, verse 19. Revelation 19, 19, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies. There are the armies. Verse 21, and the remnant were slain with the sword. Of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeds out of his mouth, all the fowls are filled with their flesh. So up here at this last picture, you know, this I have a picture of a bunch of horses coming down out of heaven with an army behind them. And right here at the bottom, I got an army, cavalry, running in this way with banners. The first carrier that has the flag, 666. Why, those army of horsemen, 200 million coming in this way. The Lord comes down this way. The sword comes out of his mouth and kills that bunch. And that's the bunch you've been reading about in Ezekiel chapter 32. That are slain and gone down to the pit. All right, Ezekiel 32, verse 31. Pharaoh shall see them and shall be comforted over all his multitudes. I commented on the last time, and don't uh, renege and don't uh, deny it. The only comfort the devil have in hell is the people he damned. Only comfort they have is looking around and saying, Well, I got them, I fixed them, I have to suffer forever. But they do too. That's his comfort. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, with the weapons. It's like that car base on the fire on the ground open up to swallow them down alive whole. That's the Lord's army, not the devil's army. That's us. Oh, well, climb the wall and set, you know. That's that. No effort. Yeah, yeah, no effort. Where people are still alive. That's all that is. All right, uh, 33 1. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, 
Now we get on a little bit different track. We know what we're talking about through here. Most of the rest of this now. 33 and 34 are pretty easy. By comparison with what we just had. Son of man, to speak to the children of thy people, and say to them, when I break the sword upon the land, like war coming, Nebuchadnezzar, Pharaoh, or the second advent, if the people of the land take a man of their coach and set him up, set him for their watchman. If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet, warn the people. Then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood should be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood should be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. Notice the word soul used in the sense of his physical life. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among him, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will not require at the watchman's hand. Now this passage has been used for time and memoriam to teach soul winning, which is all right, and I have no objection to it, and uh, wouldn't hesitate to make application myself. But you have to be careful about your application. For example, his blood will not require at the watchman's hand. Now you make some application. Paul says in Acts chapter 20, I am free from the blood of all men, for I have not come to declare to you all the counsel of God. So there's some application, see? And Paul is saying, he's saying like, if I had told you the whole thing, your blood would have been required at my hand. See, it's kind of like that. But of course, you can't make complete application. Uh, if you don't win the souls of Jesus Christ and warn them about the second coming and about the new birth, you won't go to hell. It isn't your soul for his soul. It don't go that far, see? But something is required, and I don't know what it is. But uh, if the Lord has called you to be a watchman, every Christian is a watchman. It isn't just a preacher. Every Christian is a watchman. Uh, every Christian is told you are a son of the children of the day and not of darkness, and the day can't overtake you as a thief. And you know what the time is. Uh, you're to give the warning. And you're to tell folks the Lord's coming. The Lord's coming. Get ready. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Now, the implication is if when he comes, they're not ready, the blood isn't required at your hand, you're free, you warn them, you warn them. Now, what that actually means, you get the judgment seat of Christ and have the Lord require the blood of the unsaved in my hand, I don't know exactly what it means. I know what it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean I go to hell. It doesn't mean that. And in this case right here, it doesn't mean my life physically for his life, it doesn't mean that. There are Christians that don't uh, witness and warn people about the judgment. They live up to six or seven years old. The people they don't warn get killed in the teens. You can't make application all the way, you see, but there's something to it. All right, now let's take verse two and can see what's in it. But I bring the sword upon the land. All right, the Lord is coming back here and the sword comes out of his mouth. If the people of the land take a man of their coast, set him for their watchman. Now the people didn't set you up, but the Lord set you up. And the Lord called you, you are a watchman. If when he sees the sword come, you know it's coming. If you see the sword come upon the land, for example, if I see, Lord shows me something, and say, well, here in about two years, there'll be some race riots and famine the Civil War and stuff, then I'm the war. I blow the trumpet. And I say, get ready, it's coming. All right, when he sees the sword come upon the land, he blows the trumpet to warn the people that whoever hears the sound of the trumpet, take it not warning. That's not the way he's talking about, it's just talking. If the sword comes and take him away, his blood should be upon his own head. Tough apple should have listened. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood should be upon him. But he that taketh warning should deliver his soul. The sword won't get him. A uh, man sees people right. coming, he says, the symbol of seeing people coming and hides himself. Uh, don't you know something in Noah's day? And Noah stand up there warning and warning and warning and warning and warning and warning. Boy in the morning, putting up that ark. Crowds down there, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. He couldn't get him by believing with his own family. <laughs> like that comes as near as always, a warning that comes uh, days, weeks, months, whatever falls. Those things don't come unexpectedly. Those Jews in Europe between 1920 and 1935 when Hitler finally got them boxed in when they couldn't get out, they knew perfectly well what was coming. Any Jew could have found out. 
I mean, all he had to do was read Mein Kampf. That's been enough, been, been enough warning for him. Boy, read Mein Kampf, and then Hitler got the chancellorship from Hindenburg. That'd been time to sell a store and clear out. And by the time they got ready to clear out, nobody wanted them. And they just trapped him there and then killed like flies. All right, verse 6, but if the watchmen see the sword come and blow out the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from them, he is taken away his iniquity, but his brother lie requires the watchman's hand. Now you fellas go down the street and get preaching down there, you know what you're doing? You're blowing the trumpet. You're giving the warning. You're saying it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, get right, it's coming. And now I'm going to pay attention to you. But you've gotten the blood off your hands. It's on your hands. When it comes, it's on there. When it comes, you don't have to beat yourself and berate yourself about it. If you've warned them. I was talking to a young fellow up there in one of those camps recently somewhere. I forget which camp now, so many of them. But some young guy there about 19 was telling me when he got back, he just cried. I'm going to do better. When I get back, I'm really getting with this. And I said, well, good. He said, I'm all tore up. He said, right before I came up to camp here, he said, my best friend got killed in an auto accident. And he said, uh, I never witnessed to him, or the guy was saved or not. And he said, I've been talking now with some other people that knew him, and by his actions, what I know about him, what they said about him, he's probably in hell. And he said, I'm never going to take a chance like that again. Well, I hope he doesn't. I hope he doesn't. His brother, I require the watchman's hand. Uh, when we get to heaven, I'm sure God's going to hold us accountable for our immediate sphere of influence. Now, you may not be able to get everybody, and you forget people times. I could kick myself around the block at the times I've missed having a track on me when I needed it. Amen. And I was coming out of the airport the other day, and uh, the family bought Fritz out, and Fritz was there in the airport, you know, loose, walking around the crowd, enjoying himself. And uh, came up to meet me, and we started out, he began to run to the crowd. And some people, you know, more afraid of a dog than they are the symbolic plague. And going by there with that crowd, a bunch of people there, I heard one woman say, Somebody get that see blank dog out of here, you know. And I was right in front of her face, she said it. And I said, that Lord isn't damned. I said, that dog isn't damned. I said, the Lord takes good care of him. And one went. Like that. And when I got to the door, and opened the door, the trip went over the main part of the, of the terminal. I just happened to look back. That woman was still standing there. I said, what in the world make of that? Well, that been an ideal time to have a track on you. See? You say, read this, boy. They'll read it after it, running like that. But you may remember get all of them. I've gone out and had the utilities to take care of and bills to pay and stuff. And you get in that rush, you know. You know that rush? Flam, bam, 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 bam. First thing you know, you visit three places without leaving a witness, see? And that isn't good. That isn't good. You all leave a witness at each place you go every time one shows up. Now, how much that Lord's going to hold you accountable for? I'll tell you one thing right now. If you're going to school, the Lord's going to hold you accountable for every friend you have in school. If they're close enough to you where you're eating with them, and dating with them, and drinking with them, and studying with them, you're close enough to reach them. And the Lord put it on you. And the same way, if uh, in a town like this, the Lord gives us a radio program here come on Sunday morning, uh, I have no alibi for facing God of the judgment and saying that the people of Pensacola weren't warned. I mean, what a thing, man, for a guy to get on that radio for five or six years. And never warn them about hell the second coming of Jesus Christ. And some of them never do. I've heard programs and FM stations that I've monitored for six years where the man has never talked about hell on one program in six years. That's a disgrace. And if Lord ever puts you in a small church in a small town or a big church in a big town, every couple of weeks you just, you just preach hell. Make it hot. Make it burn. Just upset them and get them mad and just get them all tore up. And just keep them that way. Seven. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman to the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word of my mouth and warn them from me. Well, we've got to close here, but isn't that a beautiful verse? Look at that. Son of man, that's you. I have set thee a watchman, that's you. To the house of Israel, that's for anybody in this dispensation. Therefore thou shalt hear the word of my mouth, not the mouth of scholarship, the Christian education, the word of my mouth, you get the word from him, and warn them from me. You take the word God said, and you warn them the word God says. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, if thou dost not speak to warn the wicked man from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, 
speak of Zionism, equity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. I notice how the reference is the physical life. Uh, for that, I'll give you a first illustration. Before we close, come back to Second Kings in just a minute. I'll show you the perfect illustration of a life for a life where a man has been entrusted to something and then hasn't come through with it. Uh, oh, let's see. Second Kings. I think it's Second Kings. No, it's just the first Kings. Yeah. Uh, 1 Kings 20, verse 35. This is an example of blood being required for blood, a soul for a soul, in the sense of physical life, for a man has been entrusted with a job and didn't do it. Now, I, I, you might be able to apply that somewhere. I mean, I've made some application there. Maybe the Lord's very definite deal with you about dealing with a certain man or a certain person. You don't. Maybe the Lord will get rid of you. I don't know how that goes. But maybe there's something to that right there. It's something very definite. I mean, the Lord knows what he wants done. First Kings 20, 35. You ever hear, you ever feel a real strong compulsion to witness to somebody? You better witness. Because you know something, you don't often get those strong compulsions. You know that? I've been saying that for 25 years. I can't think of more than four times in 25 years where I really got under a terrible burden to be with one individual, particularly a particular time. Just about four times, 25 years. The rest of the time, you have to go with faith. But if you ever feel that compulsion, you better move. First Kings 20, verse 35. And a certain man of the son of the prophet, that will match Ezekiel, said to his neighbor in the word of the Lord, that is a commandment from God, smite me, I pray thee, and the man refused to smite him. I mean, you can't blame him. So one of your friends walk up to you and say, Thus saith the Lord, hit me. 36. Then he said to him, Because thou hast not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from me, a lion died and slew him. Aren't you glad you're not living under the Old Testament? <laughs> they found that you could die quick in those days, boy. Life was risky. Then he found another man that said, Smite thee, I pray thee. And the man that smote him so hard, he wounded him. That's the fellow believe the word. <laughs> he said, Thus saith the Lord, you're to hit me. Okay, wham, man, like to put him in the hospital. So the prophet departed. Aren't you glad God hadn't told you to be a prophet? If you're about a sermon illustration, the Lord said, This sermon illustration is going to be a busted jaw. That's the sermon illustration. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. As the king passed by, he cried to the king and said, Thy servant, referring to himself, went in the midst of the battle, making up a story. And behold, a man turned aside, brought a man to me, a prisoner, and said, Keep this man. If any means he be missing, then shall thy life be for his life. Or else thou shalt pay a down of silver. Well, maybe you lose some of your rewards. Maybe that's it. And as the servant was busy here and there, he was gone. The prisoner got away. And the king of Israel said to him, So shall thy judgment be thou thyself as decided it. You've got either die or pay the money. And the prophet hastened and took the ashes away from his face. And the king of Israel discerned him that he was one of the prophets. Now, wouldn't that be something that guy stand there? Wouldn't that be something to look at that guy pull out that thing off there? And take off the sackcloth and ashes and old boy stand there with a maybe a busted nose and a black eye and blood all over his face? That's the illustration. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, because thou hast let go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed utter destruction, therefore thy life shall go for his life, and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house, heavy and displeased, and came to Samaria. All right, we'll close there and take a break. All right, Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 9. Now these are warnings about uh, the wicked and the uh, righteous in Israel, uh, right before the destruction of Jerusalem, and God has set up Ezekiel as a, as a watchman, verse 7, and called him by the favorite name of the Lord Jesus in the New Testament, the Son of Man, verse 2, Son of Man, verse 7, Son of Man, verse 10, Son of Man, verse 12, Son of Man, verse 24, Son of Man, verse 30, Son of Man. When the Lord Jesus Christ referred to himself in the New Testament, he referred to himself by this title more than any other title. That's his favorite title, when the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. Jesus actually quotes from Ezekiel more than any other book in the Old Testament, which means that uh, Jesus Christ was sent as a watchman to the house of Israel to warn them, because that's what Ezekiel was sent for. 
Now notice in this, uh, in these warnings here, how differentiation is made between the wicked, look at verse 8, the wicked, and verse 13, the righteous. In other words, in the Old Testament, there's a difference between the godly and the ungodly, the righteous and the wicked, the just and the unjust, see? And you find that thing mentioned once in a while in the New Testament, but in the New Testament it's all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Now you find Luke and John sometimes, uh, somebody saying, he doesn't know what manner of woman this was that touched him because she's a sinner. You find in John chapter 9, we know that sinners hear not God. And Galatians, Paul said, we're, Gen we're Jews and not sinners of the Gentiles, talking to Peter. You'll find it once in a while. Wherever you find that thing, it's always a reference to save and unsaved throughout the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Paul says, Christ came to save sinners of what? Of whom I am chief, see? Now, technically, those holiness people have a point. They, they talk about the difference between a Christian and a sinner. Well, actually, there are saved sinners and unsaved sinners. But actually, a Christian is a third class. Now, now we use the term, but technically, a Christian is not just a saved sinner. A Christian, according to Acts chapter uh, 11, is somebody who has forsaken all to follow Christ. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. A discipleship, see? A discipleship's not getting saved. The saved sinners, the unsaved sinners, and the Christians. And a Christian is a disciple. That comes from discipline. D-I-F-C. Discipline. Disciple. All right, in Ezekiel chapter 32 then, in the Old Testament, if a son does bad, he's a bad man. If he does good, he's a good man. That's how it's handled. It's handled like that. All right, Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 9. Nevertheless, if I warn the wicked, bad man, of his way to turn from it. If you do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. Now, do you see how that changed in the New Testament? In the New Testament, Christ said, If a man believes not that I am he, he shall die in his sins. You shall die in your sins. If what? If you don't turn from iniquity, no. You don't live right, no. If you don't believe that I am he, see? Now, see the difference? In the Old Testament, that salvation has the element of faith and works. In the New Testament, it's pure faith. Turn to John for just a minute. Get John chapter 8. And notice this business about dying in your iniquity and dying in your sins has nothing to do with your righteous life. John 8. John 8, verse 34. John 8, verse 34. John 8, 34. Jesus answered, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever committed sin is the servant of sin. Verse 36. If the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Verse 21, I go my way and you shall seek me and you shall die in your sins. 24, if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. See? So your damnation hinges on your belief in the New Testament. Or <coughs> well, Ezekiel chapter 33 verse 9, if he turn, his, turn not from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Notice again how the word soul is used. In the sense of physical life. In the Old Testament, the soul is joined to the body, so they're spoken of synonymous. Therefore, thou son of man, speak to the house of Israel. Thus ye should speak, saying, uh, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we find a way in them, how should we then live? Oh, I know those two things. If our transgression and our sins be upon us, and we find a way in them, you can die with sin in you and on you. How then should we live? You can't. You can't live with sin in you and on you. Now, when Jesus Christ died in Calvary, there were two thieves crucified with him. He's up here, and there's one on this side and the one on this side. And the one on this side will say, turn it down, and he dies in his sins with his sins on him. And this thief over here dies with his sins in him, but no sin on him. And the one in the middle dies with sins on him, but no sin in him. See the difference? Christ dies with the sins on him, but there's no sin in him. If you're saved, your sins are in you, but they're not on you, they're on him. And if you're unsaved, your sins are in you and on you. Ezekiel 33, be our sin to be upon us, and we find a way in them, how should we then live? Say to them, as I live, saith the Lord God, God is swearing by himself, pretty strong. As I live, saith the Lord God, underline it, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Now, I want you to be clear in that. 
Talk about election and Calvin. God says, he don't get any unsaved people, wicked people dying. As he lived, God swore by himself, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. All this Calvinistic stuff about God wanting to make his power and wrath known upon the vessel of fitted destruction. Uh, there's no such thing as a vessel of fitted destruction before Genesis 1-1. There's nothing to make vessels out of. That thing there in Romans chapter 9 about pottering the clay is dealing with clay. There's no clay in Genesis 1-1. There's no clay in Genesis 1-2. There's no clay in Genesis 1-2-3 and 4. The clay don't come with the vessels until man is made out of the clay. God doesn't predestinate you to go to hell and die in your sins. As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But the wicked turn from his way and live. God isn't in favor of killing anybody. God isn't in favor of killing anybody. Not even bad people. But he'll do it. Turn to Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. And Deuteronomy uh, 32. Pick up uh, verse uh, 39. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Now, the devil has the power of death. Hebrews chapter 2. And when your time comes to go, the devil is the executioner. Hebrews 2, Job chapter 1. But the judge is the Lord. The, the Lord decide whether or not to... Let the devil take your life or not. Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. Isn't that something? You think a God out there in the universe lifting up his hand and saying, I live forever. Wow. You talk about conceit, how's that? You talk about egotism, how's that? The Lord's all there is. I mean, people forget that. We keep thinking that, you know, even Christians get funny ideas about that. They keep thinking that Christ's going to kind of help them out in trouble and a nice, sweet person that died for the sins. And that's true, but that's it there, see? Lord says he's out there in some place you can't even find, see? Lifting up his hands and say, I live forever. Nobody challenges for it. Nobody opens a mouth. Yes. Uh huh. Well, that's much as saying this. I don't have any pleasure in folks dying. And I want them to live, but if they don't clean up, slam. In other words, Ezekiel chapter thirty-two is a statement on God's attitude. Now, what you're talking about is an actual case where the guy doesn't get it right. Then it's something else. All right, now Deuteronomy 32, verse 40. For I lift up my hand to heaven to say I live forever. If I whet my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, here it comes. I will render vengeance to my enemies and reward them that hate me. So God's got two sides. Now, he's not for you dying, and he's not for you dying your sins, and he's not for even the wicked people dying. But if no repentance and no getting right, and the devil takes them, then it's all over. In other words, once you're dead, then that's it. There's no second chance. There's no come up to judgment. And the Lord is saying, uh, I'm so sorry I have to do this. And come to think of it, I'm, I'm, I repent of my meanness, and I decided not to do it. <laughs> it isn't going to happen. It isn't going to happen. All right, verse 12. Ezekiel 33, 12. With the fourth hour son of man, save the children of thy people. The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. Were yours? The righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. Were yours? Yes, yes it will if you're righteous in Christ. Now, if you're talking about the day of his transgression, the day that you do wrong, you won't be delivered from reaping the effect of your sin. But as far as going to hell goes, your righteousness will get you by if it's Christ. But in the Old Testament, it's not Christ. When he says the righteous of the righteous shall not live in the day of his transgression, he's talking about a man that's doing right and counting in that right to save him. That fellow messes up, his righteousness can't save him. The righteous of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. Now you take old David, there's a good one, righteous up to a certain point, and then does wrong, and he says the day he did that, then his righteousness will not deliver him. And it didn't. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness. And then when the wicked man gets right, he'll laugh. 
Neither shall the righteous be able to live for his righteousness in the day that he sent it. Well, aren't you glad you're not under that? Now, what if you were saved just to your sin? And then you're going to go to hell. Wouldn't you be in a fix? Like some of these homeless folks? I got a letter home that says a guy got me salvation up there. He's over in Springfield and talking about I'm just worried to death about going to hell because I read in First John where it said he that committed sin, so forth and so on, and 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 uh, he that is born of God does not commit sin because his seed remain in him and he cannot sin because he's born of God. That's got that kid just all tore up because he knows he's saved, but he's done something wrong. He knows that he that is born of God does not commit sin. Now, in the Old Testament, that fellow's put in this kind of position. He's put in a position where as long as he does right, he stays alive. If he messes up, God can kill him. Sometimes the Lord doesn't, does it, sometimes he doesn't. For example, David go along right, then he messes up, and when he messes up, God doesn't kill him. But David knew he had a killing coming, because David said, I have sinned against the Lord, and Nathan said, The Lord hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. See? But you better have not tried to pattern your life after David. That's one of those choice servants who's an exception. And if you ever doubt it, don't forget back in Acts 13, he said, I'll give you the sure mercies of David, which were given to him, which were not given to Saul. Saul got gone along, messed up. The Lord said, okay, that's it. That's the end of it. Had him killed. So that's all the Old Testament is put on a system where it's faith and works. Now, when he messes up, he's a day you're getting killed right there. You know what he better do right there? He better offer the blood of the Lamb. See? Faith and works. Faith and works. Faith. He got to offer that thing right there. Now, when David messed up, he had a problem because he committed a sin for which there's no offering. You ever read back there in Leviticus chapter 11 on adultery and Numbers 35 on murder? When you murder somebody, there's no offering. He said, you're taking from my order, Numbers 35, that he may die. Remember that thing, Numbers 35? A man commits murder in the Old Testament, he can't come and offer an offering to get cleansed. He had it. So when David committed that sin, he knew he'd had it. So that thing goes along like this, trusting in faith and works, faith and works, faith and works. And he's in the place right there where David was, well, that thing where God can take the fellow and kill him or let him go, and God is merciful to the fellow, then look at look what happens. Turn to Psalm 51. The Lord dealt with those folks in the Old Testament, every one in a different way. Boy, you can't find doctrine on the salvation of the Old Testament for love and money that's consistent prayer through. Old Samson messes up, and the Lord lets him go. He messes up again, the Lord lets him go. Messes up again, the Lord lets him go. Messes up again, the Lord lets him go. Messes up again, the Lord kills him. <laughs> Weird. Psalm messes up, the Lord lets him go. Messes up, the Lord lets him go. Never did kill him, just died of old age. Weird. Psalm 51. Now watch old David here. Here's a picture of the saint who can't offer the offering but still has faith, even though he doesn't have righteousness. Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Verse 5. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, I desire truth in the inward part. See, David had a grasp of the law. He knew what, what if there was more to it than the outward part. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with a hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than the snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bone which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sin, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from my presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He could have lost the Holy Spirit and knew it, and knew it. Saul did, and didn't get him back. And Samson did, and got him back. And David didn't. <laughs> you can't find six doctors in there. Twelve. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Now here it comes. Sixteen. For thou desirest not sacrifice. No sacrifice for those sins. Else I would give it. David said, if the way to pay for it, I'd pay for it. The Lord knows the heart condition. In the Old Testament. It's not just a matter of keeping the law. None of them kept all the law. There had to be faith and works. Anybody went through what David did and didn't have the attitude he had would be a dead duck. But only God knows the attitude. Verse 16, Thou delightest not in burnt offering. Here it comes. The sacrifices of God are what? The blood of the Lamb? No, sir. The blood of Christ? No, sir. The Old Testament conformed to the blood of Christ? No, sir. 
The Old Testament looking for the crucifixion, not on your life. The sacrifice of God or a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. See that thing? Now there's the inner life of the Old Testament saint showing where he is depending on God for mercy, even where he doesn't deserve it. And it's true in David's case, and some of them it's not true. Verse 19, when the Lord returns, 19, then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then shall they offer a bullet upon thy altar. Sacrifices later. Not now, not for that sin. Those sins there, you've had it. Oh, I'd like to Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 33, verse 13. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, he, no, he sure could have. He could have dropped it right on the spot. Well, yes, as it turned out, that's what it was. But, oh, yeah, sure, man, he could kill anybody any time just for, for any violation of what he said. Well, it, 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 you have to be careful that there because he says, in the day that you said, I should surely die, and she didn't die physically, so something died. So as it turned out, it was spiritual. But he sure could have killed them both. On Ezekiel chapter 33, 13, it's a good thing the Lord is merciful. It's a good thing the Lord lets you get away with it more than once. And if he hadn't, why, there'd be corpses all over Pensacola and all over the United States. If the Lord killed everybody for the second time that did the wrong thing, you couldn't walk from here to Atmore without stepping on bodies. Amen, 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 and amen. Ezekiel 33, verse 13. Well, I shall say to the righteous that he shall surely die, or surely live, if he trusts to his own righteousness and commit iniquity. Now, there's two things. The, 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 the faith, trust in his own righteousness, but then the works and commit iniquity. All his righteousness shall not be remembered, but for his iniquity be his committed, he shall die for it. Now, wouldn't that be something to live like that? I'm going to serve God 50 years and then mess up and die and go to hell. Wouldn't that be something? I sure am glad I'm under grace, not under work. Again, when I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die. Now, you notice the tribulation application these passages. Matthew 24 said, he that shall do to the end shall be saved. The guy goes through that whole thing right there, and then right at the end it says, my Lord delays his coming and begins to eat and drink with the drunken and beat the servants. Bam, he goes to hell when Christ comes back. Verse 14, again, when I say to the wicked, thou shalt surely die. If he turned from his sin and knew that which is lawful and right, works. If the wicked restore the pledge, works. Give again what he robbed, works. Walk in the statutes of life, works. Without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins that he has committed shall be mentioned unto him. He has done that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. Now there's a beautiful case of this, an example of this in the Old Testament. Let's turn to Chronicles. And I'll show you one of the best examples of it anywhere in the Word of God. Uh, 2 Chronicles 33. Here's one of the most wicked kings that ever came over Jerusalem. Matter of fact, it was the worst. The worst king that Israel ever had was Ahab. But the worst king that Jerusalem ever had was Manasseh. 2 Chronicles 33. Now, Rehoboam's a bad one. He made Israel to sin. But boy, Manasseh, the longest reign, was the worst one. Now, watch what the Lord does this character. 2 Chronicles 33, 1. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 55 years in Jerusalem. That's the longest reign any king of Jerusalem ever had. 55 years. But did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like the abomination of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Now watch this verse go. Verse 3. Balaam, groves, worshipped the stars, servants, built altars, five, Orders for the host of heaven, six, burned his kids, enchanted, witchcraft, familiar spirits, wizards, wrought much evil aside the Lord to provoke him to anger, set up a carved image in the house, so forth and so on. Verse 9, so Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem the heir, and to do worse than the heathen, whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but, but they would not hearken. So what happened? Wherefore the Lord brought upon him the captain of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns, and bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. 
And look at this. And when he was in affliction, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him and was entreated of him and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. And there's a fellow just messed up as bad as you could mess up. And the Lord just didn't kill him. Put up with him and just knocked the fire out of him and got him right. And when the fellow came back, verse 14, 15, 16, he cleaned up. He cleaned up. Verse 18. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and his prayer unto his God and the words of the seers that spoke to him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. His prayer also and how God was entreated of him and all his sins and his trespass, and the places where he built high places, and set up groves and graven images. And before he was before he was humble, they are written among the sayings of the seers. And of course those seers have recorded that stuff in the Psalms. I don't know how many of those Psalms are prayers of Manasseh, but some of them are bound to be. All right, back to Ezekiel chapter 33. So in the tribulation, in the Old Testament historically, in the tribulation, you have an element of faith and works. Now, when you go out there and begin to show some of that, they'll pop right up and say, Ruckman is a heretic. Ruckman has six plans of salvation. Ruckman doesn't believe in salvation but grace. Ruckman doesn't believe that Christ heals. Ruckman doesn't believe that Christ saved yesterday and whatever. Uh, Ruckman has been indicted for this and that. And tell them just to shut up and go blow the brains out and save the devil the trouble. <laughs> I mean, enough many worse than a garbage mouth nut that doesn't know what he's talking about. I don't think anybody, if anybody ever got saved, didn't get saved for grace. What's that got to do with faith? It's a crazy folks. You know what they're talking about. Just blah, 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 blah. Why does it work for the grace of God? Everybody be in hell, wouldn't he? Who doesn't know that? Now, what's that got to do with anything? All right, Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 17. The folks just, just profess to be experts and all this. Blah, 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 blah. They don't know if the Bible teaches edification Bible school. Let me go back to plumbing. Uh, anybody that thinks what you just read then of salvation by grace through faith ought to have their head looked at. You just read verse 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Can you find that it completed salvation by grace through faith in that passage? I'd like to see it. All you read in there was works. Works, 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 works. Boy, you really want to get one, get Matthew 25. You ever read Matthew 25? How these nuts can think that there isn't a plan of works up in here and up in here after reading Matthew 25 is beyond belief. I was sick. You visited me. I was in jail. You came to see me. I was naked. You clothed me. I was hungry. You fed me. Come on, get the kingdom. No blood atonement. No new birth. No salvation by grace. No spiritual circumcision. No believing. No receiving. No repentance and no confession. Just pure, unadulterated works. Ezekiel 33, verse 17. Yeah. Ezekiel 33, 17, yet the children of the, thy people say, the way of the Lord is not equal. But as for them, their way is not equal. When the righteous turneth from his righteousness and committeth iniquity, he shall even die thereby. But if the wicked turn from his wickedness and do that which is lost and right, he shall live thereby. Yet ye say, the way of the Lord is not equal. O ye house of Israel, I will judge you, every one, after his way. You see, it's an individual judgment. And you never know the heart. In the Old Testament, you never know the condition. You never know whether the guy is going to paradise or going to hell, or whether he was on his way to paradise and headed for hell, on his way to hell and headed for paradise, or whether his faith is enough to overcome his bad works, or his bad works enough to counterbalance his faith. You never know. Is God just dealing with a fella and say, you cuss that blood and do work. 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 And the New Testament is, trust that blood, trust that blood, trust that blood. And to him that worketh not, but believeth on him and justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted to righteousness. Ezekiel 33, 21. I'm glad I'm living now. I wouldn't want to go on back then, boy. I mean, I'd have had advantages back then. I mean, if I live right and the guy had persecuted me, I could ask God to kill him, he'd drop dead. David used to do that. David used to say, catch him, kill him, put him in hell, put coals of fire in the head, man, let him burn. Lord, do it. <laughs> David used to pray and say, Lord, they're asking me wrong, but I didn't have to get them. They're asking me how to get me now to persecute me. Lord, catch them in the old net and wipe them out. Lord, do it, too. Back in the Old Testament, fellow get on me and say, Lord, I've done right, and I've been right, and I've done all to do, and I've kept all the commandments going. You told me to do make me rich. Lord, just dump it on him. 
Wouldn't that be great? I wouldn't be great. <laughs> if, the, if, if the doubts about salvation came with it. That's what old Job couldn't understand. Don't you see what a mess Job got into? He just lived as near a perfect life as a man could live. Inward and outward. And the Lord just smacked him with an incurable disease. That's a great situation. That ain't a work situation. That's a reversal. And that guy got down there and his three buddies came around and said, well, we know you're living like a devil. And he said, how come? And they said, well, look at you. What do you got? And he couldn't answer him. Oh, Job said, well, I just don't know. But I know he'd try me when I'm come for him to come for him like gold. So he slay me and I'll trust him. But my own integrity, I'll, I'll maintain. I've kept my ways before him. I cling to my righteousness and will not let it go. <laughs> he just hung on his integrity and said, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, and I've done this. I didn't deserve this. And they sat there and said, you're lying, you're lying, you're lying, you're lying. That's why you got it. That's what that whole book is. And get in that thing, the Lord popped up and said, well, I'll tell you what, Joel. He said, you did right, but I got news for you. You can't trust your own right. Faith and work. See that thing? All right, Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 21. It came to pass in the twelfth year of our captivity, in the tenth month, in the fifth day of the month, that one had escaped out of Jerusalem, came to me saying, the city is smitten. Now, this is when Ezekiel was over in Babylon, and he gets news from one of the captives that uh, Nebuchadnezzar has hit Babylon after destruction and tearing it up. It jumped forward because the other ones earlier. There are several captivities there, matter of fact, there are three of them. And this city smitten here is when Nebuchadnezzar actually comes in and begins to tear him down. And by the way, this is a fulfillment of Ezekiel uh, 24 27. Look at Ezekiel 24, 27, and 26, and notice this is the fulfillment of something the Lord told Ezekiel earlier. He says here in 26, that he that escapeth that day shall come to thee, and cause it to hear it with thine ears, and in that day Ezekiel open up and start giving it to him. So here comes the fellow that escaped. All right, Ezekiel 33, 22. Now the hand of the Lord was upon me in the evening, afore that he was escaped came. And it opened my mouth, fulfillment of 24-27. Until he came to me in the morning, my mouth was open and I was no more dumb. Dumb in the sense of deaf and dumb. You understand deaf and dumb, a man silent, dumb, not mean stupid. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man. I was reading Living Bible last night, thanks for service. And uh, did you know every time where it says the word of the Lord came to me saying, it says the Lord spoke on this occasion or a message came from the Lord. They've taken the word of the Lord out of the Old Testament in a hundred passages. So they clean out the word of the Lord. Just slap and slap out. At the beginning of the prophetic form, it never says, The word of the Lord came to me, thus saith the Lord, the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord has been removed from a hundred passages in the Old Testament. And you know what that is? That's an attack on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the word. Ezekiel 33, verse 23. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man. They that inhabit those wastes of the land of Israel speak, saying, Abraham was one and he inherited the land. I mean, he could fight off the enemy all by himself and did. Abraham was one and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land is given to us for an inheritance. Now, the way that thing works is, when Nebuchadnezzar comes in there and tears the place up and leaves, the ones that are left there are saying, well, no problem. I mean, Abraham, he conquered his enemies by himself. We got a couple of thousand here, so it's our land. Nobody can run us out. So they're getting ready to do wrong again. Twenty-five. Wherefore say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, You eat with the blood. Blood forbidden in the Old Testament. Lift up your eyes toward your idols and shed blood, and shall you possess the land? The Bible says, Trust in the Lord and do good, and thou shalt dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. It doesn't say trust in the Lord and kill folks you want to dwell in the land. And shall you possess the land? You stand upon your sword. That's taking a stand with the sword. And it's a stand upon the sword, taking a stand like this. So the sword here. Or taking a stand like this here. You stand upon the sword. And you get ready to use the sword to kill. You stand upon your sword. You work abomination. And you defile every one of his neighbor's life. And shall you possess the land? Say thou thus unto them. Thus saith the Lord God. As I live. Boy, on the Lord swears by himself, you can, you can put a lot of money on it. Thus saith the Lord God, as I live, 
Surely they that are in the way shall fall by the sword, and him that is in the open sea will I give the beast to be devoured, and they that be of the forts and in the cave shall die of the pestle. For I will lay the land most desolate, and the pomp of her strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be desolate, that none shall pass through. And so they've been for years, years, years. As a matter of fact, they were desolate from the time of... You ever see pictures of Palestine even now, most of it? You ever saw how crummy it looks? I mean, you take those pictures around Galilee and the Jordan Valley, some of that just looks green. But one of the reasons I've never cared to go to Israel is every time I see pictures of it, it looks like West Texas. I just see rolling hills of rocks and gray and kind of yellow-brown dirt. I don't care about looking fast. And someday it's going to blossom like a rose, and they're making attempts at starting it right now, but that won't happen until the millennium. And besides that passage of the desert to bloom like a rose wasn't a reference to Palestine. It was a reference to the Arabian desert. For all the oil is. It'll have to bloom like a garden, because once upon a time it was a garden. All right, uh, verse, uh, verse 20, 29. Then shall you know that I am the Lord when I have laid the land most desolate because of all their abominations that they have committed. Also thou son of man, the children of thy people are still talking against thee. He's standing up there giving them negative, hell, fire, and damnation, thunder and lightning, he's screwed down to a fine poison. As soon as he finishes, all the Jews go back and didn't talk about him. They're having roast Ezekiel after every service. I uh, still talking against thee by the walls and the doors of the houses. They'll do it to you. Lord calls some of you guys to preach. You just get ready to get put on the spit and make shish to bar about it. You're going to do it. You're going to do it. No man can stand up and exhort and rebuke and tell people off without resentment sometimes. No way can do it. And I'll take it, you, take you out of, out of microscope, put your sins down this way, and get that magnifying glass, and blow that from the area and turn these him up so he looks that big, you see. And the reason for that is to find an alibi to do what they're doing. They want an alibi to sin. They can find something wrong with you, you've got to get an alibi to keep on doing what they're wrong. Now, if God calls you to preach, that's going to be your cross. You're just going to have to bear it. If you're thin to skin, get over being thin to skin. Because you're going to get talked about it. Amen. Amen. I uh, still so talking against thee by the walls and the doors of the houses and speak one to another. Every one to his brother saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. <laughs> so, Bible believers, they want to hear the Bible. They're saying, Let's go to church this Sunday and see what he has to say. Come, I pray you, to hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. They're not in in the bunch. They're all Christians. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they hear thy words. Oh, they sit before thee as my people. Some of them are not his people. And they hear thy words, underline it, but they will not do them. That's the difference. In one ear and out the other. They hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show us much love. They all talk about love, 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 love. He doesn't have enough love. He needs more love. That's what they'll give you. I talked with a young man we ordained about two months ago, got up there up north, had him a good work going, and uh, get started out with a big bang, had some good revivals and things, and his work was really growing, and the people got kind of quiet, and kind of torpid, and kind of unresponsive, and he tried to get them going again, began to preach them some good hard messages on sacrifice and discipleship, and another fellow up there whom I've known for 20 years, he used to handle hundreds of tapes, came around him after the end of the service and said, brother, you that was a very hard message. I've never heard even Brother Ruffin preach that hard. You don't show enough love in your preaching. And that guy told me about that. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And I said to myself, well, you take that bird, just scratch him off. That's just how every worldly, carnal Christian in this town talks. I wouldn't think of that as saying that to any man ever in my head. I, I guess I've heard every great preacher in this century just about preach. I wouldn't think of saying that to any preacher ever heard in my life. I have never heard a preacher in my life that I'd go around when I got through and say, you didn't show enough love, even if he didn't. I mean, that's all. Maybe God didn't want to have him show any love. How do you know what God wanted? You know what God wanted? Maybe God wanted to have him just give you an unsheeted raft to stew down at nitric acid. You know what God wanted? I wouldn't tell a guy that. That's his business. You like somebody listening, they're little, uh, sitting there and they're love sick and wanting to need more love. The Bible said that, I, I'm not trying to buy that, but he says, the love of God is shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Ghost. Let's give it to us. 
You can, get, you can get it all from God. That's why the Holy Spirit was sent, to be a comforter. A uh, preacher wasn't sent there to give you love. <laughs> but the Lord is there for. He takes care. I know he said to speak the truth in love. Talking about telling the truth to each other. Mixed with some love when you do it. But now your sermon is going to be in love. I got some sermons that are about love. Got some at all. I got one sermon called the Ten, the Seven Terrible Words. Cursed, anathema, you know, Belial, Beelzebub, you better love that message. It's supposed to be. You come looking for love, get your record and play something else. Seek your 33, 31. And they come to thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words. But they will not do them. You guys get out in the ministry, you're going to find that. You'll tell them, win the soul, win the soul, win the soul. They're not going to do it. They're not going to do it. The, the average the average church member of the average church today doesn't lead souls to Christ, and the average church member of the average church today does not with The average. Now, you may get above average, but uh, you're going to be a minority. If you have a church of 200 people and 40 of them turn out for visitation, you've got a church on fire. That's something. You get a fourth of them, boy, you're gone. you got a church of 2,000 and 500 come out for visitation, man, you got you a power plant. You got a church here, well, I say, even less than that. If you have an eighth of them, you'd be doing good. If you have 8,000 people in church and 800 for visitation, you've got a strong visitation program, man. Because they just don't do it. I remember when, in day, I passed the church's days where two men came out for men's visitation out of 200 people. Two men, that's one tenth of the congregation. And I had been a couple nights where I went by myself. And I remember a couple more nights where one guy showed up to go out with me. Question, boy, not so handsome. Yes. Well, there you go. There you go. Back to in the word, not doing it. The thing was, preach the gospel every creature. That was the thing, not just the absentees. <laughs> All right, they will not do them. You talk to people about prayer. Very few Christians pray 15 minutes a day. They hear thy words and not do them. You talk about reading the Bible. I don't read the Bible. I, I talked to a young man. I talked about reading the Bible to a period of 15 years. I haven't read the Bible through yet. I tell you something else. They're not going to. You know why? Because they're just plain rotten. That's why. They'll come and sit and hear the word. And they won't do it. Oh, that's over their mouth, they show much love, but their heart goeth after covetousness. I want this, I want that, I want this, I need this, I gotta have this. Their heart goeth after covetousness. Want, want money, want buildings, want clothes, want friends, want food, want this, want that. And lo, thou, the preacher, art of them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice. I like to hear him preach. I enjoy his messages. <laughs> He's a fine little preacher. <laughs> and can play well on instruments. <laughs> so they like to be entertained. They don't like to be told off. They like entertainment. They sit there and say, that's a pretty good message today. I didn't like that one today. That was a good one last night, wasn't it? No, I like it better than night before. You know, it's not as good as it used to be. Well, I thought that one was real good, you know. They sit there, turn the dial, and try to figure out which program they like. That's not biblical Christianity. That's the world. That's the world. I hear those fellows preach. I don't go to sit there and judge on the message. I hear those fellows preach. I sit there to get something from the soul. And sit there and get a cussing out and a balling out that I need. Bob Jones used to say, if a preacher don't make me feel mean, he's no good. I always just feel that way about it. If a preacher don't make me just feel mean as a devil, there's something wrong with it. When you finish a good service, go out the door, you'll just feel like a dog going out the door. Amen, 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 amen. You're just going to walk out there and say, oh, 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 you get, God knows, as you get going around, those old proud thoughts come back quick enough, don't they? Don't they? I mean, the first thing you begin to think about, the, I saw y'all, I know y'all, and I smart y'all, and I thank you, God, I'm not another man, even yeah. a Republican. And you start going around there, you know, and I thank God I don't cuss like that fellow, and smoke like that fellow, 
And the end of the week, you're right back up again where you shouldn't ought to be. Well, I didn't get uh, finished. We're going to have to stop here. I will stop here at this verse and take it up next time. Uh, verse 31. I want to finish the chapter, but uh, you get in the Word, it gets run away with you, man. It gets run away with you. And one of the greatest troubles today with America, as you probably know it, is people come to a service to get a show, a performance. While some of these Southern Baptist churches are getting the place where they come in there, they have to get wilder and wilder to get a show, and now they're getting a hippie band in there to keep folks entertained. It's all entertainment. We had a lady one time in our church, now real mad at me and sick the deacon board on me, because she said the young men, they're shouting or amen, interfere with her performance. And when I heard about that, I said, yeah, I guess that's right. <laughs> I guess that's right. But a piano player is not there to perform. See? She's there playing for the Lord. And when somebody's up here with a special not here to perform. You're not putting on a performance. You're up there serving the Lord. Yeah. Oh, they really get wild. We got a path here in town. And God bless him, I love him, and he's one of my converts, so I guess I ought to bury the sin for him. Uh, he had a fair at his church. You know, pitch the penny and the toss, you know, and a midway, you know, and all that clown, carnival, whole thing. That's a performance, that isn't a service. Oh, yeah, that'll get him. One had a parachute, jump out of a, you know... When Brother Rice went to Hiles recently, a pastor down in Tampa told me that they bought him his pet horse for him to ride around the building, you know. Shipped his horse in from Murfreesboro. And in exchange, he gave Brother Hiles a new Trump brother, Pontiac or something, and drove it down the aisle of the building, you know. Oh, glory. Queen for a day, you know, Jack Bailey. <laughs> now, I'll tell you, that's, that's this new generation of Christians. And I'll tell you, I, I don't, if I know the Lord like I think I know him, he's going to turn around and shoot them. <laughs> the Lord not interested in that kind of business now. Now, you serve the Lord, not just in the good days, but in the bad days. And if I preach a judge once in a while, I put up with it. Uh, you'll probably preach some yourself. And if some of the young men here preaching, Brother McGay, he doesn't always give you just exactly what you want, why, just remember, Brother, uh, nobody back foul. Amen. That's good. I could preach Brother Ruckman. Amen. <laughs> okay, take a break. Oh, I think it's chapter 34, verse 11. Now, the context of this passage is judgments on the shepherds of Israel. Notice from 34, 2, this is a negative prophecy against the shepherds, and the shepherds are leaders in Israel. Uh, the shepherds here, is, uh, as they stand, Ezekiel 34, like the leaders of Israel that are supposed to lead the sheep and supposed to feed them and strengthen them and don't do it. And the Lord is pronouncing these judgments against the leaders of Israel. And then he says in Ezekiel 34, 11, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. That uh, becomes fulfilled in the New Testament, John 10. The Lord says, Since you won't seek them, I'll seek them. Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. Well, I come to John chapter 10, the New Testament. And here's the Lord showing up as a shepherd doing his own seeking. John chapter 10. Get John 10 in one hand, get, uh, get Luke 15 in the other. John 10, Luke 15. The Lord says, since you won't run them down, then I'll run them down. Luke 15. Luke 15, John 10. All right, first of all, Luke chapter 15. Luke 15, verse 4. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he has found it, he lays it upon his shoulder, rejoicing. When he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. So the Lord says, I'm going out and get them like a shepherd gathers his sheep and I'm going to bring them home. Now, those things are also true of a soul winner. You go out there and get the lost sheep and bring him back, there's rejoicing in heaven. And that lost sheep there is likened to a sinner that needs to repent. I found my sheep which was lost. 
Oh, uh, one of those painters has a picture of Christ on a mountain, bending over and reaching down and picking up a lost sheep. And it looks like a shepherd when you first look at it. He has a shepherd's staff, you know, on a robe. But if you look carefully, with the head bent down like this, you see a crown of thorns sticking up over the shepherd's head. And the one hand's reaching out like this, yet the sheep has a hole in it. And there's an eagle circling around above that sheep up in the air. And that's a picture of Christ saving the sinner. And that's a picture of the sinner's uh, problem. If you're unsaved, you're like a lost sheep on the side of a mountain and the eagle's about to get you. And you're helpless. Nothing be any funnier than a sheep trying to fight an eagle. And you know that eagle do it? That eagle get up in the air like this and buzz around like this and fold his wings. And then he'd drop like that and hit that sheep on the head with his head or his claws. Then he flies back up. Then he circles around and he drops. It's like a dive bomber. And after he hits that sheep four or five times, that sheep begins to get head stung and dizzy and pretty soon he slips and falls. Oh, 500, 2,000 feet. And that eagle circles around, goes down, and picks up the bones. And that's a picture of every unsaved person. They think they're bold and brave, going to live it. They ain't going to do nothing. You're just going to sit out there in the cold and starve to death, and the eagle gets you and eats you up. And uh, it isn't, the sheep doesn't get up and come home. When he come, comes home, he says, Look at me. I held out faithful all the way, and I endured to the end, and after a mighty struggle, I finally made it. It don't work that way. The shepherd picks up the sheep and brings it home, and he says, look at this sheep that I found, rejoice with me, because I found my sheep. <clears throat> Here are some testimonies you think somebody mightily fought their way home to heaven. Like that song that says, if anybody makes it, surely, Lord, I will. <laughs> well, if anybody makes it, surely you won't. Uh, the shepherd has to pick the sheep up and carry it home. All right, John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 11. John 10, verse 11. A sheep's the dumbest animal in the world for its size. I got a goat who lives next door to me. He's a brown goat. Every morning I come out, he's looking at that fence going, bleh, bleh. He look at you that half crazy look in the face. You know, they look like they just lost their mind or something, you know. Look at you, bleh, bleh, bleh. <laughs> That's a picture of an unsaved man. You go over and tap that thing, you pull his head back, you know, real sensitive and scared, and stand by the thing there and put his, tries to play with Fritz. Fritz goes over, you know, and crouches and jumps at him, you know, and that goat will try to frisk. Nothing more awkward than a goat frisking. And it's paws, you know, don't work like a hammer around. And that thing there is a picture of an unsaved man. Uh, shepherd has to get him. John 10, 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is in the hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming, and leaveth the sheep, and fleeth. And the wolf catches them, and scatters the sheep. The hireling fleeth, because he is a hireling, and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and knoweth my sheep, and am known of mine. Now the picture of the unsaved man is doctrinally, <clears throat> dead and trespassed and sin, alone in the world without, without God. But practically, the picture is a picture of a lost sheep. I was talking to the man up in Dayton, Ohio. <clears throat> he was a hard shell Baptist, and he was, you know, hyper Calvinist, and he was telling me he was elect from the foundation of the world. You know, he was saved before Genesis 1 1. And then he found it out when he got, you know, when he, the Holy Spirit brought him to repentance. He found it out there, you know, like jazz. And I said, well, in plain words, you never, you never were lost, were you? He said, no, he said, I have the Christ, that I have I the sheep, the son of the fold, I'm one of his sheep. I said, uh, you weren't always one of his sheep. Oh, yes, I was one of the sheep that had not yet been the fold. He came out and got in the back of the fold. <clears throat> well, that's interesting, but it isn't true. I mean, before you were saved, you know what you were? Ephesians chapter 2, a child of nature, a child of wrath. Ephesians chapter 2, dead and trespass and sin. Ephesians chapter 2, alone in the world, without hope, without God. That's how you were. Now that figure of the sheep is a figure, and it's an interesting figure, but if you want to know doctrinally where you were, you weren't a straying sheep, you were dead and trespassed in sin, you were not the Lord's sheep, you were not his flock, and he didn't know you and he wasn't interested. Uh, you talk about the point of, uh, of doctrine, that guy was acting like he'd never been lost, he'd just been elected all the time. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says, before you were saved, you were alone in the world without hope, without God, and strangers from the covenants of God, and strangers from the promise of Israel. You weren't a sheep. Matter of fact, you know what you were? 
<coughs> You're a doll. You want a sheep? Amen. All right, back to Ezekiel chapter 34. Then that's a picture of salvation. But doctrinally, it's not, it's not the doctrinal truth on it. Ezekiel 34, verse 11. <clears throat> For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day, that he is among his sheep that are scattered. So will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. Now the context of the sheep here is Israel. And he's talking about Israel being scattered and him coming to get them. Now notice uh, 1948, right in front of your face, verse 13. I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land. What's the date in that writing? What is it? 587? 587 B.C. Well, I'd write down 587 and add to it 1948 and tell me how many years it took that verse to come through. 1948. Five something? What's that, 2,400 years? 2,500 years? 2,500 years. All right, if you were born since 1940, you lived to see the greatest thing that happened on this earth since the resurrection of Christ. And a lot of folks in Pensacola just missed it. And when that Jew went back and set up his land and set up his nation in 1948, he fulfilled a prophecy that was 2,500 years ago. Came right in on the money. Let's get to the next chapter and look at uh, Ezekiel 36. <clears throat> Ezekiel 36, verse 8. Ezekiel 36, 8. But ye, O mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are a hand to come. For behold, I am for you and will turn to you, and you shall be tilled and sown. And I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, even all of it. And the city shall be inhabited, and the waste shall be built. And I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit. And I will settle you after your old estates, <clears throat> and will do better to you than at the beginning, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. All right, again, the same passage. Verse, uh, verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you, and, and cause you to walk in my statutes. You shall keep my judgments and do them, and you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I shall be your God. Now, over and over again, this thing comes through. For example, go to Ezekiel 37. Over and over again, that Old Testament says the Jews going back, the Jews going back, the Jews going back, the Jews going back. Every religious leader and political preacher in the Christian, Southern Christian Conference, Martin Luther King, Abernathy, Rap Brown, that bunch, every leader in the National Council of Churches, Sotman, Peel, uh, Blake, Kagawa, Gandhi, and that bunch, every one of them thought that Ezekiel was a liar. Every one of them. Every man I just named believed that you would not go back and would not reestablish and that the promises given to Israel belonged to the church. Every man I just named, except Gandhi, and Gandhi was a practical atheist. Gandhi said one time, Christians were what prevented me from becoming a Christian. So Norman Vincent Peale said he was one of the greatest Christians he ever knew. Well, you think you'd take the public word for it. And if I told you I was an atheist, you wouldn't go out and say, that's one of the finest Christians I know. <laughs> you have to be a liberal to talk that way. All right, Ezekiel 37. Now, what could be clearer? Verse 22. Now, begin at 21. Ezekiel 37, 21. And say to them, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will bring them on every side, and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. And one king shall be king to them all. And there shall be no more two nations. Neither shall be they divided into two kingdoms anymore. Now, see that thing there? I mean, over and over again, he said, they're going back to the land. They're going back to the land. They're going back to the land. Now, if I was a liberal or a teacher at uh, Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, I'd read it like this. Verse 21. Thus saith the Lord, I will take the children of Israel 
from among the unsaved people, quill their loss too, and gather them to the Calvary at every side, and bring them into Beulah land and heaven. And I'll make them one nation with the church, the body of Christ, in the church, the house of God, and one king, Christ, will be king to them all. That's how you read it. Look at verse 24. The king is not even Christ. Who's the king? David. See that business? In plain words, there's a believing Bible study, and then there's Bible study. All right, Ezekiel 34. Now those pastors say they'll go back to that land and inhabit that land and become a nation again. And in 1948, they became a nation. Now they're not yet converted. The conversion always follows the return. And somebody's asked another day about the rebuilding of the temple over there. And I didn't have this information, but I'll read it to you now. Uh, on the rebuilding of the temple, are they rebuilding it? Here's the information. Colonel Shlomo Gorin, August 1967, led 50 Jews to a prayer meeting on the mosque, where the Mosque of Omar is, the Dome of the Rock. When they captured that place, you know, in that six-day war, why Colonel Shlomo Gorin took 50 men that went into the mosque and prayed by the mosque. When that happened, Musha Dayan, who was the general, and the chief rabbi of Jerusalem, and the city council of Jerusalem ordered him to stop. They said, don't pray up there by that mosque. Uh, the idea is that Arabs get upset and start a holy war, and if they ever start a holy war, then it'll take the grace of God plus something else to get Israel out. <coughs> because in a holy war, what happens is all the Arab countries around Palestine would all get together in the sense that they line up shoulder to shoulder and then begin to walk in the holy war, men, women, and children. And they just walk to the sea. That's all you do. You just line them up arm to arm, head to head, neck to neck, uh, oh, say 14 million people. And then you just walk through Israel and take your casual as you, as you go. Because in the Holy War, if you get killed, you automatically get a passport into paradise and Allah, you know. So uh, what the Jews want to avoid is a Holy War. And the way to do it is leave the mosque alone. Now somebody said, well, Somebody said, well, well, how can they get the thing down? Well, the Lord might do it by an earthquake. That'd be a good one. I mean, they, nobody could blame anybody then except the Lord. Now about the rebuilding of the temple. In May 21st, 1967, it was, the rebuilding project was, a, was supposedly started, and they said it'd be complete. And they said it was complete. One Jew said, our maker will see fit to pay us a visit here on earth. Here come, 2 Thessalonians 2 from Rome. The sponsor of this ad that appeared in a British magazine, 1967, is unknown. But the ad appeared in a magazine in Britain called Christian, Christianity and Christianity Today. And the ad said, the rebuilding project has started. Shipments to Israel from Pier 26 to New York are being made. 500 railroad lo car loads of pre-cut stone from Bedford, Indiana. That ad appeared in the British Magazine, 1967, May 21st, and nobody ever found who put the ad in. So that's how the rumor got started. They checked the authoritative sources in Silasburg, Indiana. Betty Pace, the office of the Secretary of the Indiana Limestone Institute, said... They have no foundation for the report, but thousands of tons have been shipped to New York with, quote, no way of determining the ultimate destination of every order. The limestone ship was found to be similar to that in Bedford, Bedford, Indiana, and that limestone was similar to the limestone found in Jerusalem. And the reason why somebody got the rumor together is because Jewish net masons had been brought to Bedford, Indiana, to study pneumatic drills for stone cutting. So between the Jewish masons coming to Bedford and studying how to drill limestone, and the limestone there matching the limestone Jerusalem, and carloads of limestone being gone to New York, somebody in Britain put an ad in saying that at Pier 26, the limestone was being shipped to Israel. So all the Christians over here said, you see the blocks already prepared and ready to go over, which they may be. Well, that's how much, that's how authentic the report is. However, 
Every Jewish rabbi has been told to pray daily for 1,800 years, quote, Jewish prayer, may it be thy will that the temple be speedily built in our days. So they've been praying that thing for 1,800 years. All right, then the Lord said they're going to go back and settle this land. Now, I'm not going to read a long thing to you on going back and settling the land, but give you just a few statistics. Uh, in 1917, there were 25,000 Jews in, in uh, Palestine. In 1922, there were 83,000. In 1932, there were 180,000. In 1937, there were 430,000. In 1945, there were 500,000. In 1955, there were over a million. In 1960, there were over two million. Now there are over three million over there right now. Over three million Jews. In 1928, uh, 1,800 crates of grapefruit were shipped out of Israel. They grew their own grapefruit. In 1932, they shipped out uh, 150,000 crates. In 1924 and 25. They sold 1,131,672 gallons of milk. Uh, they produced themselves. In 1941 to 42, they uh, put out 26 million gallons. The increase, increase is 2,600%. Uh, in one year, for example, 1935, 101,541 Jews came to the land. In uh, 1939 alone, that one year, uh, uh, 80,000 came to the land. 100,000 out of the first 155,000 in Jerusalem were pure-blooded Jews. Now, 100,000 out of the first 155,000 that came to Jerusalem had no mixed blood in them. They had no Gentile ancestry. Most of the Jews that go back to Jerusalem have Gentile blood in them somewhere. And some of them have Hamitic blood, which has been a real course of contention over there. And, all those rabbis and things arguing about whether a Hamitic Jew can take the, you know, come to the temple and take the Passover and all this and that. Or if he can be called a real Jew. I have a big argument about that. Uh, in 1932, a school at Tel Aviv was established for navigation and seamanship. And April 17, 1949, the first Jewish coins were put into use. And the last coins they used were 135 A.D. So, for 180 years, they have many coins. That country been running 180 years, having to use foreign currency. I mean, 180 years. <laughs> oh, what's 135? 1800 years. For 1800 years, they had to use foreign currency. And then after 1800 years, they got their own coin back. Now, all that happened in line with the King James 1611 authorized version. And when that book was printed, they had no currency. When that book was printed, they weren't back in the land. And that book says they'll go back and they'll do this and they'll do that, and they do it. All right, uh, back to Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel 34, verse 14. Ezekiel 34, 14. I will feed them in good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. They shall lie down in a good fold, and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock, and will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. And I will seek that which is lost, and bring again that which is driven away. I will bind up that which is broken, and will strengthen that which is sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong, and I will feed them with judgment. Now notice how the two advents overlap. Although you're reading in verse 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, a literal fulfillment at the second advent, look how close that thing matches Christ's first coming. For example, verse 16. I'll seek that which was lost. What did Christ say when, when he first came? The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. I'll bring again that which was driven away and bind up that which was broken. He's healing broken arms, broken bodies. I'll strengthen that which was sick. He's healing the sick people. But I will destroy the fat and strong, the Pharisees, and I'll feed them with judgment. So there's an overlap. And you have spiritual application one time, but you have a final application another time. Now notice that undoubtedly those second half, then look at verse 28. And they shall be no more a prey to the heathen. For boy, they've been a prey to the heathen ever since the first half, then. They'll no more be a prey to the heathen, neither shall the beast of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. That never happened at the first coming. 
there's anybody, I don't know anybody think that happened at the first coming, do you? Because they'd no more be a, a prey to the heathen. They're a prey to the heathen. They were hunted. I guess one of the most tragic things you ever read in your life is the story of Treblinka. And Treblinka was a Nazi concentration camp that was finally torn down and plowed under. And then the dead bodies were dug up and burned and the ashes were sprinkled in the ground. And a pathway was made over them so that after World War II and the Army Occupation Force came in, they couldn't find any trace of the camp that even been there. But Treblinka probably, it probably gassed a half a million Jews, maybe a million. Auschwitz took care of about three million. But Treblinka, they, they had a capacity of 6,000 a day to cremate and gas. And that thing there, you read about that thing about those Jews in there trying to revolt. And they had a revolt all organized, and it cost the lives of a hundred of them to get it organized. They found the grenades didn't have any cotter pins in them, and they couldn't explode them. And they went on again for another year or so and got another revolt going. Finally, they had that revolt. About 4,000 of them broke out of there. And the 4,000 broke out, uh, just broke out into the woods and hung around the woods. And 400 of them finally survived that.